Hey guys, this is Christopher from InventBox, and in this tutorial I'm going to talk about the geometry of a lathe tool, how and why they cut. Now in this video I'll be doing a lot of theoretical machining to demonstrate the concepts that I'm trying to teach. I know that theoretical machining may sound like an oxymoron since machining is such a physical activity, but I think that this method will work well for what I'm teaching. The best part about theoretical machining is that you can do anything you want. If you want to cut hardened steel with a cardboard tool, you can. You can also pretend that you have every tool that you ever wanted. In this case, I can create all the useless tools that I need to demonstrate how tools don't cut, so that I can explain how they do. The first attribute I'm going to explain on a lathe tool is the relief or clearance. So to show that, I'm going to make a theoretical part. So here's my part on the lathe, and it's turning about this axis. So here we have our tool that will be cutting this part. It makes sense that because we have a square tool and we would have a square shoulder on our part, that we could easily cut this shoulder with the tool that we have. But this isn't going to work exactly. Um, because there's not any relief on the sides or the front. There's a couple reasons why you need relief. The first reason is because if you have your uh, tool perfectly at 90 degree angle, first of all, there's not really any way to guarantee that it is perfect. But even if it was, if you had it rotated slightly at an angle and you didn't know, then whenever you um, cut your shoulder, your shoulder is going to look more like this. It's not going to be a square shoulder. So if you have um, your tool with the point at less than 90 degrees, then it gives you a little bit of room on your angle. You don't have to make sure your tool is perfectly square to your part. Another reason why you need less than 90 degrees here is for clearance. So here is our part again. And if we have our tool with clearance on both the front and the side, that means the tool is, um, the cutting edge of your tool is going to be the furthest in front and the furthest to the left which means all of the other tool is behind it. We want the cutting edge, the nose of our tool, to do most of the cutting. So we want the rest of the tool to be behind it. Otherwise, the back um, and side of the tool are going to be cutting where we don't want them to be, and it'll be rubbing up against where we want them to be relieved. So you need to make sure you have relief on the side and front of your tool so that it's not rubbing and so that you can get a square shoulder without having an angled tool with an angled shoulder. Now you're also going to need to have relief on the bottom of your tool. So if you're looking at the face of your part and it's spinning in this direction and your tool is going to be cutting on this side and say we have a tool that looks like this. If our tool looks like this, whenever the tool comes in and contacts your, um, your work, it'll look like this, and it will contact right around here before it hits the cutting edge, which is on top, and won't actually hit, it'll just rub down here first. So if instead, your tool has a square front, that's better. Now um, your circle is touching at your cutting edge, but depending on how you're feeding in, it can still interfere a little bit down here. So if you have bottom relief, then your tool is going to be angled like this. That means the cutting edge is the farthest point um, in front of your tool. Everything else is behind the cutting edge. 
that means it's out of the way and your cutting edge can do all the cutting that it needs to without being hindered by um, the bottom of the tool. Now here is an example of a tool that does not have side relief. This is a parting tool. It's just a flat piece of metal with the cutting edge only on this profile. It has front relief, but not side relief. That means the tool can easily plunge into your part, but will have a lot of trouble cutting side to side because there's no side relief. But it doesn't need to cut side to side because it's just a parting tool or a grooving tool. Another aspect of your cutting tool is rake. Now rake is similar to relief, except it is on the top of your tool and doesn't really provide clearance for anything. But um, say you have your tool, it's got your bottom relief. Again, this is looking at the face of your part and it's spinning down. A zero rake tool would look like this. A negative rake tool would look like this. So this is angled up a little bit. And then a positive rake tool would be like this. So zero is flat. Uh, that's zero, negative, and positive. So zero and negative rake tools are normally for softer materials. Um, because if you use a positive rake tool, sometimes it will grab into the soft material and try to pull it in. But normally, negative rake tools do more rubbing than cutting. And positive rake tools are better for cutting. Zero is in the, in the middle. But it all depends on what material you're using um, for your rake that you need. But generally, you're going to be using a positive rake for most things. So you can kind of think of rake as sharpness, but it's a little bit different. So you could have a sharp tool that has a negative rake and a dull tool with positive rake, even though it looks like the positive tool, the positive rake tool is sharper. But say if you zoomed in on this negative rake tool, and it might be like this as a sharp corner but then maybe the positive rake tool is more like this even though um, the angle is sharper you could have a radius on your tool which would make it more dull and then even though this angle is wider it could still be sharper because they come together at a point. So the rake is similar to sharpness, but not the same. So here we have the rake, and then you could also have the sharpness of your tool. Almost all of the time, you're gonna want a sharp tool over a dull tool, but everything plays into surface finish. Normally you're going to want to have high sharpness high sharpness, and a positive rake for most tools. Now, if we look again at the top of our tool, um, so if we have our profile of our part like this, looking down on the lathe, and we have our tool here, if we zoom in on this point here, we can also have like a sharp or a dull point. So if you zoom in, it'll either be like this or like that. This top sharpness is what we call the nose radius. So the nose radius on this tool would be very small and the nose radius on this tool would be very large. The advantage of having a small nose radius would be um, if you're doing a shoulder like this, this corner is gonna be a very sharp corner. So if you zoomed in, 
on the corner of a sharp or a small nose radius tool, it would probably look like this. But if you zoomed in on a large nose radius tool, the corner would look more like that. So that's the advantage of having a sharp or a small nose radius tool, you get sharper corners. But the advantage of a large nose radius tool would be the surface finish. Whenever you use a tool like this, your surface finish is going to have lots of little bumps in it as you feed along, but with a large nose radius is going to be more like this. So there are more gradual uh, radius on your surface. That would be if you zoomed in a lot on your surface. You wouldn't be able to see these unless you were feeding really too quickly. But normally, large radius is going to give you a better surface finish than a sharper nose radius tool. Regardless of what your nose radius is, you can increase your surface finish, make it smoother, normally by decreasing your feed. So the feed of your tool is the rate at which it moves along the Z axis, or in the X axis if you're doing um, a face or shoulder. But in this case, we'll say it's along the Z axis. So if you feed, um, for example, on this part, if you feed 10 thousandths per revolution of your tool or of your work, then the distance between each of these bumps is going to be 10 thousandths of an inch. If you decrease your feed, so maybe it's only 2 thousandths per revolution, then these bumps are going to be a lot smaller and it'll probably increase your feed. Although you can't get your feed infinitely better the slower you go. Sometimes you have to speed up your feed a little bit to get a better surface finish. There are a lot of factors that play into it. But anyway, normally you can slow down your feed to get a better surface finish because these bumps are going to be smaller. So when you're worrying about your surface finish, one of the biggest aspects um, determining that would be your feeds and speeds. So your feed, like I said before, would be your tool travel rate. So that's how fast your tool is moving side to side or in a route. And then your speed is your spindle um, rotational rate. That's just how fast your chuck is moving or how fast your part is moving rotationally. Feed on a lathe is normally measured in inches per rotation and then the speed is normally measured in rotations per minute or RPM. So inches per rotation and rotations per minute. In order to know what feeds and speeds you have to use when you're cutting, it's important to know what materials you're using. The materials, um, that includes your cutting tool and your part. So if your cutting tool is carbide, then you're gonna be able to cut faster feed and speed than you will with a high speed steel tool. And you'll be able to cut faster if you're cutting aluminum than if you're cutting steel. If you want specific numbers for your feeds and speeds, you can look up charts and tables online that will tell you what you need for the materials that you're using. And I will put the chart that I normally use in the description so you can see that. Some of the most common materials that you will be using for your tool will probably be tungsten carbide and 
high speed steel, which is normally abbreviated HSS. You'll see this on drill bits and tools quite often, and that's what it means, high speed steel. Tungsten carbide is a lot harder and more brittle than high speed steel is. And whenever you're using a tungsten carbide tool, you can use higher feeds and speeds than regular high speed steel. Common materials for your work, um, the part that you're cutting, are steel, aluminum, and brass. So steel is pretty vague. There are all different kinds of steel, but generally steel is gonna be the hardest that you can cut. And then aluminum is softer and brass is softer even. Steel ranges the most in hardness um, because it's a really vague term for many metals. But this is going to be normally the slowest RPM and brass is going to be the highest RPM. So those are the main elements of your cutting tool on a lathe. Relief, rake, sharpness, nose radius, and tool material. Now I'm going to show you some examples of lathe tools and point out to you some of the reliefs and angles that I talked about earlier. So here's a cutting tool that has a little bit of relief on both sides and certainly on the front. It has a very large nose radius, which means it'll probably leave a good surface finish, but it's so big that you probably wouldn't use it all for shouldering. Probably just straight cuts. This is a high speed steel tool, which means if you need to, you can grind it into any other shape you want or adjust the rake or the relief angles. This is a carbide tool, which means it's harder than the high speed steel, but you can't really grind it into whatever shape you need. It is an insert tool, which means the tool comes pre-made and you just have to attach it to a tool holder. It's a little bit harder to see the reliefs on this. Um, they're a little bit more gradual, but it does have relief in every direction. And the rake is a little bit positive, but mostly zero. This tool is also carbide, um, but you can tell by the shape of it that it's actually not a regular right-handed tool. You can see that the cutting edge is farthest forward on the right, which makes it a left-handed tool. It would be able to cut a shoulder on this side, not on the other side like a normal tool. Everything about the geometry of a left-handed tool is the same as a right-handed tool, except it's just a mirror image. This one has pretty extreme relief and rake. This tool here is neither carbide or high speed steel. This is actually a tool steel. This is one that I made myself and you can see that the geometry is quite different than anything I had explained so far. The reason is because this is a form tool it looks like there might be a cutting edge right here, but really this entire circle, this arc, is a cutting edge. This form tool is used for making circles. With a form tool, basically, you would just plunge into your part and it would leave an imprint of whatever the shape is on your tool. And in this case, it would make a sphere because we'd have half an arc here that would go on both sides. If you look at the geometry of the tool though, everything is pretty much the same. We have relief here on the front and this entire face is relieved. Um, if you look at the bottom of it you can see that the cutting edge is farther forward than the rest of it. And this side here is to help line up the edge of your stock um, with the edge of the tool. But basically um, all of the aspects of the tools are the same, except it doesn't really have a nose radius since the tool is really long and drawn out. You could have a form tool with really any shape. It doesn't have to be um, an arc. You could have some design on a form tool that would make a design that you wouldn't normally 
be able to make on a manual machine. Here's a boring bar and geometrically it's pretty similar to the other external tools that I have. Um, you can see clearly it has front relief here, it has side relief here, and from the top you can see it has both front and side relief. So if you're looking at a cutting tool that you've never seen before, you should be able to identify what type of tool it is and how it's used just by the geometry of the tool. All of the tools you see here are lathe tools, but really all of these principles should apply to any drills or end mills just the same. Anything that does cutting needs to have all of these same principles. Although there's a lot to be learned here in theoretical machining, at some point we have to go back to the real world. And here we are, back in the real world at our real lathe. Now I'm not going to be doing any cutting in this tutorial on the lathe, but you probably should be doing cutting because especially if feeds and speeds are a new concept for you, it's something that you need to learn by yourself. Even though you can look at charts and tables to find the right feeds and speeds, those are for ideal tools and your tools might be a little bit different. So you need to make sure that you do some practice passes and cuts on your own lathe to see what works for your tools. After a lot of practice, you should be able to get consistently good surface finishes on your lathe with your tools. I know this video probably would have been more exciting if I actually did some cutting on the lathe, but it certainly wasn't as boring as the last video. The next video though certainly will have lathe work on it, and it will be on work holding, or the different ways that you hold your workpiece, whether it's by the chuck, with or without the tailstock, and a bunch of other ways that I'm going to show you how to do it. Make sure you subscribe to see when that video comes out and all of the next videos. And if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And thanks for watching.